Greetings, everybody. Um, my name is Taylor Hobinum. I am the director of the Coast Jazz Orchestra and also teaching a course uh, for the AAAS and music departments called Jazz, uh, Black Creative Music and American Culture. And I am very excited to welcome you to our second iteration of Coast and Creative Music Conversations. Let me introduce my excellent co-host, Mr. Noah Campbell. Hello, everybody. I'm Noah Campbell. I'm a 21. I'm a government major, AAAS minor, and I'm a TA for a Taylor's Jazz History course, and it's uh, great to be here today. And we have with us, uh, we have an incredible opportunity today that makes me extremely excited. Not just uh, one of the preeminent musicians, performers, composers, organizers, activists in the creative music scene, the incredible Mr. William Parker, um, but also uh, the fantastic historian, musical activist, organizer, Cisco Bradley, who has just published a brand new biography, an authorized biography of William. Here we have here, Universal Tonality, The Life and Music of William Parker. Um, and one of the underlying themes of the history class I've been teaching this term has been really looking at who gets to tell the story of this music? What perspective is it told from? Uh, what are the things in the past that we can critique or improve? And what are ways we can look to, um, to better contextualizing, better documenting, and better um, articulating this history in the present and in the future? And I feel in the past few years, there have really been a series of biographies that have really changed the nature of how this music is talked about, really raised the discursive standard, I think. And I really feel this book is going to join those as a definitive tome about how you can talk about this music, the spirituality, the politics, the creativity. Um, so I just want to pass it to start. Um, one of the things I also think is very interesting about this is that William himself is a fantastic writer, scholar, historian, has um, authored three of, in my opinion, the best uh, musician to musician oral history interview books of the past several decades. Um, so let me pass it to both of you. How did, it, how did this project come about to collaborate on writing this book? Um, Cisco, what brought you to the topic? William, what attracted you to Cisco as your biographer? Let me pass it to you guys. One thing I would say, and I don't think I actually ever said this, I don't think I've ever, actually ever shared this with, with William is, that when I was writing this, um, you know, it, working with the publisher on it, Duke University Press, I I wanted to make sure that William's voice was the the strongest voice in the narrative. So that to me was the that that was kind of my goal from the beginning. And uh, it's not, you know I I think you know creating a delicate balance because you know my author's voice obviously would also be in there somewhere, but I didn't want it to. To be done in an inappropriate way, and I didn't want it to. To I, I wanted to find the right kind of and balance between it all. You know, William has has written a lot himself, and um, he has an impeccable memory that I discovered as we as we were doing these interviews. And I wanted to re really this to be his story as much as possible. You know, uh, you know, in authoring this, so that's where I came from. Well, as a musician. You're always interested in, first of all, playing music and presenting your music to the public. And then you're also interested in um, getting the idea behind your music out to the public. Because one of the things we did in the 70s when I was playing uh, with violin player Billy Bang and Daniel Carter and Dewey Johnson and Earl Freeman, the bass player, and um, and Bill Lowe, and all kinds of people like that in the Bronx and Manhattan is that we'd spent a lot of time, Malik Baraka, a trumpet player, we'd spent a lot of time talking about philosophy, about how music was going to save the world. Now, where we got this idea from, I, I think came initially from for me it came from coltrane in that music the reason i even went into music was to inspire people and play music that was going to uplift them and put them in another state of mind so they could be 
in a live in a higher consciousness state, and 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 music was going to be the way to do it. So that was all part of the explanation of why I played music, and um, and then as I met different people and played with different people, I found out that everyone had their own way of putting the music together. Like, uh, you know, Don Sherry, when I played, you know, we played a, a week at the five spot with Don. He, he was as different night and day as when I played with Gracia Monco and Sonny Murray, as way, as way they put their music together. And Sonny Murray was totally different than Gracia Monco. Bill Dixon was different than those guys. Then Charles Tyler was different. And so on and so forth. Uh, I was playing with Maxine Sullivan. She was different. So everyone had their own story, and no story was greater than the other. It was just different and very interesting. You know, Derek Bailey was different. You know, than than Burn Nix, than Joe Morris. So so I felt that everybody should tell their story at some point because as I read the reviews and the and, and literature on the music. A lot of the writers were speaking for the artists without asking the artists uh, what's going on. And so they would say, well, he means this in this, or this is, this is so-and-so's weakest composition. And every time they said something that was their weakest composition, that was my favorite composition. <laughs> or that was my favorite piece. So I said, well, you know, the idea is that everybody's got to get a voice because everyone's got to get got to get this story out. You know, I spent a lot of time uh, later on, I guess, in in, in uh, you know, with Cal Perusha, Maurice McIntyre. He was one of <laughs> one of my people, and and Hammy Blewett. Spent a lot of time with him in the end, and uh, you know, and so everybody. I got to. I was very lucky. I got to know all of these people. Uh, we just mentioned Louis Maholo before, you know, we were roommates in Germany and I got to know, you know, where he was coming from and, uh, you know, Dave Burrell and Alan Silva. So everybody was different, you know, uh, uh, Billy Higgins, you know, I would go to Billy Higgins house every day for my schooling and we played duos, just bass and drums. And I learned about, you know, about time, you know, and, um, so I was very lucky to know everybody, and I thought it was a grand story. This whole, this whole thing, as as Beaver Harris used to say, you know, from uh, ragtime to no time, as a play with Beaver Harris and this 360 degrees music experience, and uh, very interesting. <laughs> and uh, so that was a whole part. Is that it was all from playing stride piano to playing electronic music. It was all part of the spectrum of the music. And as everyone had a different way of looking at it. You know, everybody heard their music in a different way and everybody had a different personality and everybody had a different way of walking and a different way of talking. And, and, um, and again, I was lucky to be able to go through all of these people, you know, and sometimes a lot of them in one day, just, just hanging out in the Lower East Side, you know, you know from Butch Morris, Wilbur Morris, you know, um, and, and so on and so forth. And so I got the whole idea that it was important and that, and that the documentation was important. So I was inspired by uh, a book we, we had out uh, Notes and Tones by Art Taylor. And I said, well, this, this is a good book, you know, because musicians are telling their story. It's not someone uh, that is being a mouth for the musician. So I thought that any opportunity, if someone was going to come with, to me and say, well, I'm interested in doing, telling, helping you tell your story, then I'm, I was delighted when Cisco came up and said, I'm going to help you tell your story. Uh, I had no idea that it actually would come out and turn out like this, uh, but um, it was, um, I, and I think everyone's story should be told. You know? And when they have a, a, a museum of jazz, it shouldn't just be 
you know, the people who think jazz is a democracy, they shouldn't rule and call all the shots as what is jazz. I think everybody that that's, that's paid, made an effort in, the, in, in a vib vibratory effort in the music should be included because it, it's all, um, it's like one big family. So I think all the cousins and nephews and nieces and grandmas, and imagine having a, a family where you got like over 50 grandpas and 50 <laughs> grandmas and, and many, many, many uncles. The bass player can be the, the navigator of the music when certain things aren't happening. It can be, a uh, bass player can be the, uh, the colorist when it needs to be colored. You can, be, you can play melody, you can play harmony. You can do basically anything that's ne needed to be done to keep the, the the music going it's like a leaf falling from a tree and you don't want it to hit the ground and so you keep doing stuff to keep it floating up until the wind comes and the wind is the inspiration and once the wind comes then it then it begins to sail and so um how do you deal with a community of individuals okay uh everyone's got an ego everyone's got um their their thing you know, what they say, their baggage, you know. It's like you say, you're only allowed two bags and people are coming with 15 <laughs> overweight bags. And I remember at Studio We, uh, that was 193 Eldridge Street, uh, James Du Bois, the trumpet player, Juma Sultan, the percussionist, Ali Abui was down there, uh, uh, Sonny Donaldson, uh, Teddy Daniel, uh, a lot of musicians, Wilbur Ware. And when we used to do gigs, we used to pay people according to who had kids and who didn't. So Charles had four kids. So 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 when they were giving out the money, it's like, okay, well, Charles gets a little more because he's got four kids. <laughs> he, uh, he gets a little more because his rent is due. He gets a little less because he's living with his mother. He gets, you know, so it, it, it was like, it, it wasn't, an, it just sort of happened that way. And so everyone was, 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 was paid according to what they, what they needed. And it was a really a, a interesting community that was developing down there as, as um, it wasn't like I'm the leader and, and you're the side man. It was that we are all equal in the music and we're gonna see what goes down. So what I learned from every experience, you know, I learned from every experience that I had of like, okay, when you have a large ensemble, okay, and somebody comes late all the time, but you like his playing, so what do you do? The gigs at one o'clock, you tell him the gigs at 11 o'clock. So he comes on time, <laughs> you see, and, and uh, and then when he comes, he says, why are you telling me to come so early, man? Why are you telling me to come so early? <laughs> you know. So basically, I mean, we use the word that you love everybody. And so therefore, you kind of 
uh, you know, you know where they're coming from. Again, they're part of a family and you, uh, you know how to navigate personalities. You know how to navigate arguments and conflicts. And it was just something that, that I could do and, and also not hold on to it like I did this for you, or I did this for you, or I did this for you. Uh, so it's kind of a, uh, I'd say, I would say a, a particular gift that, that, that I have to, uh, and I've been doing it o- over the years to, to bring people together. See, music to me was a was a mystery, um, and what I mean is that okay, when I was six or seven, my father would come home every night and play Duke Ellington, the menu window and crescendo and blue, and we'd have dance contests, and um, and then the next night he'd do it again, and the next night he'd do it again, and the next night he'd do it again, and Duke Ellington was my father's hero. He had two heroes. As I've been saying, he had Geronimo, the Apache chief, and Duke Ellington. And um, then about a period after that, he came home and he had a paper bag and he had a trumpet. And he gave me a trumpet and I went to the New York School of Music and was was doing trumpet lessons. And, and also I had some mail order lessons. You get lessons in the mail and every week you get a new lesson. So... Uh, but, you know, I was like, was I interested in music? I said, I don't know. I was just like, you know, I was floating. And um, then when I got in junior high school, I switched trombone and cello. Was I interested in music? No, I'm still floating. And it wasn't until uh, I began to listen to uh, John Coltrane a, a particularly a love supreme and at the same time i was listening to to ornette coleman and to cecil taylor and archie shep and i was listening kind of casual but then i began to put two and two together when i got the aesthetic message of what's going on with this music not what's going on with it rhythmically or melodically but what was going on with it the underlining purpose of it then um I went to um, a concert of, of Milford Graves, and he was talking about healing. And he was talking about playing, uh, the, he, he warned the audience, he says, now when I play this rhythm, it might, you know, it, it might do something to you. And I play this rhythm, it might do something to you. So basically what he was saying was an information, but it was also a confirmation of what I had been thinking. And I had always thought that in, in my, and, you know, I eventually switched to bass. And then, uh, and I always thought that my tonic as a human being was concert D between D and D flat. 
And I just thought that. And I kept saying that. I got to play the long D, a long D. And I said, well, what about, you know, playing the A2? I said, no, I play the D, play the D. So, and then later on, way later on, when I went out to, to Milford's house and we were doing these heartbeat sound things, you know, he said, well, yeah, you're, you know, you, you're, 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 I don't care which organ it was, but it's in, your inside is in D. Because it, it goes to the chromatic tune of D when I record this. So I was right just intuitively, not scientifically. And that kind of got me to the idea that the intuitiveness of what you do is the is is it just a, a, an exact science as science, as you believe something and you feel it, it usually adds up. You, you it usually adds up. So I think then I began to think myself think about okay of when I play, the little kids in India are going to hear this sound who are starving, and it's going to help them. So. Uh, and every time I played a note, I was projecting it out in the world to somebody in need. And just me, I didn't tell the band to do anything. I didn't, you know, but I, I, thought I was just projecting that idea that this sound is just not going to drop and it's not going to go anywhere. It's not just going, just, just going out to the listener, but it was going beyond the listener. Then this gave me confidence that when there's nobody in the audience, because sometimes two people would show up, sometimes it'd just be the stones, sometimes it'd just be this person, and sometimes it'd be nobody. And then I said, well, you know, it's going out to the world, the earth. It's going in the earth, and it's helping to balance the earth. And that's what this music was for. The music was helped balance the earth, the vibration of the music. And that's why we're still existing, because of the music. And uh, I believed that, and that was enough for me. <laughs> now, if it was about filling Carnegie Hall, then a lot of us could could stop right now <laughs> and give up playing music. You know, so you got to have a reason. You know, and that was the reason that that that, that cured all ails. You know, about I want to be famous. I, you know, you are famous. You are what you just play. You get up in the morning and play your long tones. And you've already done something to affect the world. Can I jump in to say one really quick thing? Yeah. I about that as as I think I, I've always said when I put on shows, you know, I spend time, you know, whatever it's whether it's creating posters or sending on emails and whatever, you know, getting the space or whatever, you know, that I, shows. I always say that, that that whatever I gave to it, I always got more back in return from the music from the community. So it, you know, it's it's about making space for the music, it's also about building community. And if those those two things will, will, will lift you up, you know, later on. So, you know, I, I always think that, you know, it's not about sacrificing or something in my mind. It's about like contributing something and you, you always get more back in return. So. What I learned was that music, as Albert Eilers said, music was the healing force of the universe. And he said it really clear on that song. And then he said, uh, and then Frank Wright used to always say, you know, 
uh, I've been uh, endowed by the creator to come down here and play music that's going to up that's going to uplift the world. You know, so Frank Wright said it, John Coltrane said it, Albert Ellis said it. So if you're uplifted, you're being healed in the sense that if you're feeling bad on a particular day and, and somebody plays you the corniest, corniest pop tune, like some Barry Manilow, and you know you're not feeling good at all. But when you hear that Barry Manilow, man, your feet start to tingle, your hands start to jumping, and you just jump up and you feel well, you know. So if Barry Manilow can do that to you, you know, you, you know what somebody that's actually trying to like do a, a high vibrational music can do to you. So music and art and positivity uh, uplifts you. You know, so, you know somebody smile. I mean, we'd we be standing on the on a sitting on the stoop, me and Dennis Charles on on Ave on Ninth Street where he lived between B and C, and here comes Don Cherry, and he's skating. And he's got a hat with a propeller on. And so Don comes up, and all of a sudden, man, we start feeling good. Because he sits on the stoop, and, and then we start singing some songs and communicating. So, so any positive act will uplift people and change their consciousness. And that's all you want. And that's the beginning of the idea that music will heal. The more you think about it and the more you develop it, then the more articulate you can be about it and the greater the experience for the listener can be. Yeah, I, I can just add, I, the, the very first interview that I mentioned that I did with William, I, uh, I, did, I didn't go in with an idea of what we might talk about, and he, want, and he really wanted to talk about music as healing, so as a, as a healing force. So that, I think, was the moment where I realized how deep his music was, and, and you know that it was clearly not about playing certain notes in a particular order, but it had a much deeper kind of cosmological significance. And yeah, I think that's what intrigued me to come back a year later and, and pursue this book. In working on this with William, I, I certainly didn't come in with a preset idea other than wanting to sort of investigate and explore his singular vision. Um, and so I think in many ways it, it started with chapter three. The chapter title titled "Consciousness," because I, you know I, I think I don't think William and I really started talking about his work until I don't know the fourth interview or fifth interview or something. We were talking about politics and spirituality and um, his coming of age as a teenager, which had you know like a moment in his life that was incredibly profound and kind of shaping him. Talking about poetry, talking about film, all these other things. And then I feel like it just built in both directions from there in a way, you know, building it back into earlier periods and then building it forward into the work that he did, you know, that he's done as an artist. So, um, yeah, I, I think to me, I think that's what I hope I think guided the book in a good direction in terms of it being an organic process and kind of growing out of an experience. And I, I mean, I think I just went in thinking, well, William and I are going to talk and we'll figure it out. So, Because just to add one thing, I think the key to becoming, to, to tapping into, I mean, the idea, okay, one, the, there's the idea that we didn't invent music. Music was existed before we got here and that we're tapping to an already existing river of sound. And, uh, how do you get to the magic of music? You know, how do you how do you get in there and make your contribution? And uh, you learn that okay, well, that we all have our own musical DNA. You know, I remember with the bass class that Arthur or up at the Jazzmobile. You know, Art Art Davis would write out bass lines for us to play. I would never play it. You know, and, and then some of the other bass players were saying, you know, well, we got to get to Paul Chambers. And then, you know, so I, I listened to Paul Chambers and I say, there's no way in the world I can play like Paul Chambers. There's no way in, in this lifetime or 20 lifetimes that I can play like Paul Chambers, but I could be like me. And 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 then when I was studying with Wilbur Ware, which was, the, which was really like the thing that really showed me the light, is that when I go to Wilbur's house for a lesson, he'd pick up the bass and he'd play something. And then he'd give me the bass. 
And then I played it. If I played it like him, he'd say, wrong. And then he'd give me, give me a second chance. I play, he plays something, give it to me, and I played it. He says, wrong again, buddy. One more time. <laughs> One more shot. <laughs> so finally, he gave it to me, and he played something. Then I played the way I play, and he said, that's it. And then he told me, don't you ever sound like me. Don't you ever try to copy me. you got to find your own music. And and that was a key. That was a, that was a key. You know, what makes you think that somebody else's music is more valuable than what you have to say? And, and I said, yeah, you, you got a point. So this was all confidence. I mean, because, um, yeah, I mean, it was just very important to, to realize that you know, you look inside and find all the answers and uh, of all the questions, really. And and their mentors and your teachers are sort of just to guide you a little bit. And, and if they you, if you if they need to know more, they'll ask you more. If you think they need to know more, you'll tell them more. And then if you see them saying, <laughs> paying any attention to you. <laughs> so then you, you say, OK. It's your life, and it is their life. And they say, "Well, okay." And then you know, but that's you know, but but it's like people have got to be themselves in the end, because you know they are, for some reason, they do what they do, and and um, and, and they are who they are for some reason, and and, they, and they're being told that, well, you know, uh, it's wrong to play that way, uh, or no one plays that way, and I say, well. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, it, it, didn't Louis Armstrong? They say he played the trumpet wrong. Yes, he did play the trumpet wrong. <laughs> and if he was studying with me, it wouldn't have been no Louis Armstrong because I would have told him to, to 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 not puff and not do this and not do that and not smear his notes and do this. So, so I mean, there are people who want to control art, and then there are people who want to let the let the music fly and be itself. And I, I think that's a a very valuable lesson you know, that, that I learned early is that you have to be yourself. I just want to thank Cisco Bradley, the author of this fantastic new book, Universal Tonality. I'm going to hold it up again because I, the life and music of William Parker. I want to thank William Parker for his extraordinary words, his music, his inspiration over all of these years. I want to thank my co-host, Noah Campbell, for joining us for this conversation. I want to thank all of you for watching. Um, again, thank you guys so much. Thank Take you. care, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>